I'm going to talk about underground coal gasification. I'm mostly going to call it UCG. This industry's got so many acronyms that, uh, and it, in fact, a lot of hydrocarbon people think that UCG could be unconventional gas, but it's underground coal gasification. The North Americans got a good word for it, which is in situ gasification. Okay. I think we can call the current age all sorts of things, the age of volatility. But you'll agree, I think, I hope, that we're living in the age of energy. You've all seen that graph where up here on the right-hand side there's America per capita, Australia per capita and parts of Europe. And down here at the bottom you've got China, India, Africa per capita. And you know that there's going to be an enormous amount of energy needed in the next 20 or 30 years. More and more people are wanting more and more energy. 25% of the world still doesn't have any energy but the open hearth fire. And what's really interesting at the moment is that what you can provide for that energy is not so straightforward as it used to be. There's good energy and there's bad energy. And I'm going to... Uh, well, I've said here that nuclear is suddenly out of favour. Who would have thought six months ago that nuclear would have been on the nose to the extent that it is today? I'm doing a lot of work in Riverside in the UK where they're doing an awful lot of offshore wind. It's very expensive and you know when it's really cold and you get a big cold snap in Europe, the wind doesn't blow and it doesn't cut the, me the, the mustard. Solar is very expensive, neither of them are baseload. I'm very much into geothermal. Geothermal ticks all the boxes but it's very slow to get going. So we've got a real climate of opportunity. And what is that opportunity? I'm going to try and convince you that it's UCG. Fossil fuels are going to be needed for a, a long time yet. In the short term, they're going to be needed for power, for, fo for transport fuels for several decades, I suggest. I can't see solar-powered 747s. For chemical feedstock, you're going to need fossil fuels. 90% of the world's fossil Energy is in the form of coal. I'm a geoscientist of more years standing than I care to think. And I must admit, when I saw that diagram in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, I, that was part of the reason that I'm here talking about UCG. I thought, wow, it makes peak oil is irrelevant. Gas is now higher than... The, uh, that's a pre-shale gas uh, figure but it still means that 90% of the energy is coal. But at the moment, most of that coal is not viable. It's either too thin or it's too deep or it's brown and can't yet be made into black. But once you put UCG into that mix, a very large percentage of that coal, just what percentage of that coal becomes viable with UCG, we don't yet know. But an, an awful lot of it. The other really nice thing about coal is it's widely distributed. Reg Nelson was talking about the game changer of shale gas. I don't know how widely distributed shale gas is, but I do know that coal, as you'll see in a couple of slides times, is most of the world's countries have got some coal. Not all, but mostly. It's very widely distributed. And as soon as the countries with coal realise like Australia, we're importing about 250 million barrels BOE equivalent per year. We don't have to do that. We can be creating that with our own energy coal uh, resource and exporting as much as we like. And that's what's going to happen. I think I went too. So what is UCG? Those of you of my uh, vintage may well remember as you went to school on the trains, you would pass gas works going into Sydney, going into the university. There used to be one at Wollstonecraft. Uh, I don't know when they stopped, but the very first gas that was distributed around Sydney before natural gas was town gas. And what town gas was? A uh, coal was mined, it was transported, it was put into a retort in several places around Sydney, heated up, made a gas and then piped into the cities. So what underground coal gasification is, is the mining, the transport, the retort, 
is all done underground in the coal seam with no extra kit needed down there and certainly none of the surface kit. And it's done by two long... The reason that UCG has come to the state of excitement that it is is with directional drilling. You can now drill several hundreds of metres along the coal seam and, if you like, mine the coal via the drill holes, very similar to long wheel mining. Here's a simple equation. I'm told you should never put equations up, but this one really is simple. Coal is carbon, heated up with water, and you get hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And that was hydrogen and carbon monoxide was the old town gas. It's actually called synthesis gas or syngas. As I just said, you drill two wells. How does the heat... What, where do you get the heat from? You burn a smaller proportion of the coal as you need to to heat the surrounding coal. So, again, these two... I'll do it this way. Following this diagram from Link Energy, two holes. One hole you inject steam and oxygen and air and the other, air, other hole is the production hole and they come back along the coal seam. And that's how it works. And this is the, the complete UCG um, setup. You've got a setup here, kit on the surface that makes oxygen. That gets pumped down into the coal seam. The production well comes up. And in this particular case, well, sorry, in, I'm a bit ahead of myself. What happens here, the gas is cleaned up and the CO2 that does come off gets separated and sequestrated. And that's one of the nice things about syngas, and I'm not going to get time to tell you all the nice things about syngas, but basically we're making something that's going to make less CO2 when used in power production and you sequester the CO2 that, that comes off the gas. In, we then move along to a clean uh, diesel factory. This is what Link Energy are doing at their chinchilla plant, is gas to liquids. Syngas is a very versatile gas. It makes itself readily for burning for power, but also for producing transport fuels, chemical food stocks, feedstocks. This is, in this particular example, we've got a, a hydrogen-powered, zero-emission um, power station. I was... In, in the centre of England, the three universities have got a centre which is the, for efficiency of fossil fuel technology. And I went there to, to say, well, the most efficient thing you can do with fossil fuel is UCG, to which he agreed. And he said, do you realise, this is the Professor Colin Snape, the director, he said, do you realise that, A, the cheapest way to make hydrogen is with underground coal gasification, We've all heard that the hydrogen economy will come. If it does, lots of people say when it does, he said, what, what we will do is we will pipe out hydrogen gas into the city, into each home, hospital, university, skyscraper, and we will have a hydrogen cell in each unit which will produce power on demand so there will be no losses, there will be no pollution, and your power problem solved. I said, well, that's very good. I'm, I'm very pleased and excited to be part of that. I hadn't realised... I knew UCG was good. I hadn't realised it was that good. If that does happen, that's certainly the cream on the cake. We don't need the hydrogen economy for UCG to be really good. But it's a very exciting thought to think that that might be one way that we solve all of it. No more grid lines, no more power lines, wasting electricity and costing money and, and everything else that they do may not be a hydrogen fuel cell. You will have heard that there are now other gas fuel cells. Syngas can produce those as well. Uh, I want to, ensure, to assure you that it is safe. Those of you that know a little bit about UCG will have heard that uh, Cougar Energy was closed down by the Queensland Department. It's highly likely that Cougar did not pollute at all but they sure as hell mishandled it. But they also weren't as deep as I would like to have seen them. You really want to go down deep, well away from any part of interest to any other person. Stay away from a valuable aquifer. And the really neat thing, which and there are pilot plants and, and production plants going on, keep 
the pressure in the reaction chamber negative. And then all of the gases stay in and they go up the production hole. That's, if you read best practice of UCG, which is by, put out by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, they say the Australians know how to do it, they keep the pressure negative. This was something that the Australians, uh, link and carbon in particular, uh, found out about. So there's a wrong way of doing it, but the right way is not that difficult. And I've got this little figure down here in the right-hand corner to remind me, this is gasification at 1,400 metres in Alberta. And not only are they deep, that's about as deep as the deepest coal mine. The deepest coal mine's 1.5 kilometres in England. So already is at UCG is at, that, at the very depths and will go deeper. And uh, the Swan Hills project is using saline water as well. So that's an even less use of valuable resource. I want to talk a little bit about, you, you have heard a lot in the news lately of coal seam gas. I've called it coal bed methane because that's what the British use the term. Coal, underground coal gasification is often confused with coal bed methane, coal seam gas. Uh, they shouldn't be, they're very different. The amount of, what coal seam gas is, by the way, is it's extracting the amount of, there's gas in coal that sits in the, in the cracks and it's methane. And it's, a, it's the damp, fire damp that's been killing miners, still killing miners. I don't know about since 2004, but 6,000 Chinese died in 2004 in the coal mines. And there's 30 to 100 die in America still through mine accidents. So it's been known about for a long time. What's been suddenly realised is that if you depressure that gas by lowering the water table, then the gas will come up. Hopefully it will come up through the production holes, and if you've seen things like gas lands and four corners, some of the gas comes up. Not in the in the holes, in the in the production boreholes. It doesn't. Um, we suggest that UCG, which extracts all of the energy from any given unit, is the way to go. We don't have to dewater, so you don't have ponding of potential saline water on the surface, and you uh, we have a lower a lower um, density of boreholes on the surface. Subsidence. You can, it's like coal mining, you can have subsidence or you can't, and we don't need to do any fracking. So, and, and if you do have coal seam gas to start with, you can follow it with coal bed meth uh, with uh, UCG afterwards and extract the remaining 95% of energy. So, just wanted to make that clear that they're different and, and I'm biased, but. We think there's no comparison. OK, so the advantage is that all of the available energy gets extracted. It's safer. There's no personnel under... It's safer than mining. There's no, um, no personnel underground. Compared to a coal-fired power station, there's at least 30% less CO2. I have read of other advantages of using syngas relative to other gases but let's just settle for a 30 to 40% improvement in the CO2 emissions. Energy security for all. People are really going to jump on this bandwagon when they realise that they've got their own energy sitting in their own backyards. And the other important thing is that it's plentiful. There's a, an awful lot of it. I might not remember to say when I talk about Riverside's assets, just. Two of our licences in Scotland are sufficient to power all of Scotland at its present level of demand for 150 years. So it's effectively a sustainable energy supply. And that's to say nothing of... Uh, uh, what a, a slide I'm not going to show is how little coal Europe has got relative to, to Australasia or to Russia. Europe's known as a coal-bearing place, but that's because they've utilised their coal they, in terms of world amounts, they've got very little coal. Um, OK, well, this is a, a map of... Because um, I'm left-handed, I'll stay over here. Th this is a fuzzy map because it, the, it, the coal goes offshore. And, in fact, all of Riverside's assets in England at the moment are offshore. And there's some very good reasons for that. But the, the dark patches are highly prospective. The low, 
light grey patches perspective and, uh, and the white patch is not so perspective, but you can see even where that looks like a white patch that there's an awful lot of work's been done in China. I've highlighted some of the, some of the projects. I mentioned Swan Hills at 1400 metre in Alberta. The Russians, interestingly, Lenin, Lenin picked up on, uh, on coal seam... Uh, I'm confusing it myself picked up on underground coal gasification as a way of making less hazard working conditions for the, for the workers. And so Russia went with it, and it's been taken off Wikipedia, but if you'd looked at an earlier Wikipedia description of UCG, you would have seen that there were still hazards, because apparently Stalin, when he took over and they failed, he shot them all. Um, so that was obviously very successful in getting the attention of the second rank and uh, Angren is the world's longest operating UCG plant. The Russians had up to a gigawatt of plant but then they discovered natural gas. Natural gas was easier and, uh, and away they went. I, I only know about this one Chinese operation because I was at a conference and this Chinese chap got up and said, we've been operating for two and a half years uh, we've been producing five megawatts of electricity and we're going very well. South Africans have been a smaller show which is increasing, getting larger and larger for four years. A very interesting project is the New Zealand government. Uh, uh, they want a greener and cheaper power supply, so they're going for UCG in the, south, the west side of the South Island. And then we've got Link and Carbon Energy in southeast Queensland. And I'll talk a little bit about the Australian setup as of now. There are six listed UCG companies in Australia, of which by far the largest is Link, with well over a billion market cap. Most of that market, or a large part of that market cap, comes by selling coal that it didn't want for its own purposes, and it also is in the oil business. So it's not a straight UCG company, but it has been gasifying in southeast Queensland for a number of years. And just recently, and it has a gas to liquids plant, Come, Syngas goes into the gas to liquids and they produce high premium, ultra clean synthetic diesel and a link vehicle using link diesel just recently motored from eastern Australia to Perth. Uh, it went like a dream and it was a really neat um, demonstration of what you can do with UCG. Next off the rank is Carbon Energy. Uh, they are gasifying close by, again in southeast Queensland. They've, they're about to produce a... They're getting, their engines are turning with their syngas and they're going to produce 5 megawatts of electricity with their second stage of 25 megawatts of electricity. And the third person that was supplying electri uh, was gasifying in Queensland is Cougar, which is down here at 16 mil. Cougar's now been closed down uh, they, there was an incident, it was a, a monitoring well read, I won't go into all the details, except to say I think it's highly likely that they did not pollute, but they sure as hell mishandled it. The situation in Australia is that Queensland has allowed three, now two, pilot UCG plants to, to demonstrate, and they are going to decide in June 2012 when the experts' report comes on, uh, comes into the government, the government will receive it. Every other state is waiting to see what's going to happen in Queensland. I know one of the members of that committee, uh, and he told me admittedly a year or so ago, he said, no, no government is going to be able to ignore UCG. The profit from it is just going to be too big to ignore. It's going to have to happen. Uh, I've, on, partly on that basis, I predict that Queensland They've said that these two guys can go ahead with their pilot plant for another year. That's not a problem. I predict in a year's time the industry will, will be allowed to grow in, in Queensland. Um, and a, <coughs> interacting with that, of course, is where CSG happens. CSG don't want UCG to happen because it might take some of the patch away. Just going down the list, uh, WHE at 68 market cap, that's working in Hungary. Hungary has an 80% of its energy is from the east and uh, 
wild horse are at the stage of drilling up a jork resource. Next down is Liberty. Liberty's got most, if not all, of its uh, assets in Queensland, which might be perhaps partly responsible for, for holding it back a bit. Um, it's going to produce fertiliser with, uh, uh, with its UCG. Cougar, I've mentioned. Next down is Clean Global. Clean Global has been having some management issues, which again would account for some of its uh, lo relatively low market cap. And, but it has projects in the US and, uh, and India. Um, and I didn't mention that Carbon is next project is in Chile and Link's next project is in the US. So everyone's staying away from Australia, including this little company down here in the red called Riverside. And I'd like to very quickly tell you about Riverside. Thank you. I can't, I can't operate it. There we go. Right on. What is Riverside? It's an Australian registered public unlisted pre-IPO company. Focused on UCG, well, where, where should we focus? And I've just mentioned that Australia's um, hanging five on UCG, but also it's a very mature coal province. You can't just wander into the Australia and pick up a large amount of coal for nothing. Most of it's pegged, and if it's not pegged, you might have a very expensive tender on your hands to pick up an exploration licence. So Riverside was deciding... What should we do? And this was late 2009. Early 2009, the Russians... And it was a very nasty winter in 2009 in Europe. The Russians turned off the tap. And you can't read these blocks, but these are about the nasty things that happened to the... I can read the second one, Austria. 90% of its gas was cut off. So we said, we'll go to, we'll go to, to Europe. There's a lot of coal in Europe. And we... Our timing happened to be really good. It was, we went to England. We went to England just as the English moved a moratorium out for UCG and we picked up the very pick of the, of the coal licence, as, as you will see. You will go, if you go to these coal licences that we've got are where coal is known to be. And you will see there, in most cases, a real... Gee, the good old days when coal was king, and they want coal to come back. Coal's not a dirty word in the deep, depressed and distressed old coal mining country, uh, towns in England. So it's a good place to be. They have a desire for energy security, high costs, good infrastructure, and everything else is, is good, except for one thing. They are a little slow. They're very, very careful, the English, I must say there was a rather sense of joy, particularly since I was born in England, of the colonials going back and socking it to the, uh, to the English and you'd go into the city and talk and uh, they'd say, well, why aren't we doing this? And they, but they knew. They could see that Australians with energy and a bit of money behind them just left... It was, it's, a, it's a nice feeling. Let me just share that with you. So these are our licences. The red is the outline of the lease. The lines in blue are the seismic surveys that the coal boards carried out before privatisation. Coal boards, coals were all privatised in the late 80s and they all went, they closed because they, uh, they weren't economic. Our uh, flagship project is the Firth of Forth up here in Scotland. That's been investigated, it's had a number of investigations of desk top studies by the government. They haven't yet got around to actually doing any field studies. As I say, they're a little bit slow. But, but they do say it's a great place to do it. This is the Firth of Forth here. This is the, the blue is the northern coastline, the south coastline. These dark um, patches you can see here and here are where the old coal mines went offshore. Um, they went several kilometres down into the, uh, out under the sea. Uh, one of the things that you want when you're doing UCG is really good, competent rocks between you and the surface so that the gas, if you've got the pressure wrong, doesn't escape. There was never any problem with water seepage into, the, into these coal mines. It's a really good set of rocks. And this is a very simple uh, model of the Elongate Basin, that, uh, that is the Firth of Forth, and it contains around about a billion tonnes of coal. As I said before, 
enough to supply of Scotland for 150 years. Uh, there are existing coal, carbon capture and storage systems uh, in place. And the other good thing about the Firth of Forth is that there's a power station just off to the right and there's another power station off here. Now I think that's 2.3 gigawatts of supply plus there are various chemical feedstock uh, factories scattered around. So it's a, it's a really good place to be producing syngas. So that's Riverside's um, but we were, the one thing, as I said, they were slow. So Riverside were approached by an uh, Indonesian resource company and they said, we reckon that UCG is the way to go and we've got a lot of coal in Indonesia and would you like to come and work with us? Riverside presented to the local governments and there's quite, I'm not an expert on Indonesia but I know more than they used to and there's quite a lot of, one of the ways of getting rid of the old regime and, and the... Um, corruption is to devolve the power down, down the stream, down to the local governments. Riverside presented to the local governments and UCG pilot gasification permits were granted within the month. They said, yep, we believe what you're doing, we believe what you say, we think it's a good thing, we can do it. The first ones ever issued in, and the only ones still to be issued in Indonesia, and what Riverside will do here is with a if you like, with a contracting arm, a services division, Riverside will consult or contract to those companies and, and gasify. We expect to be gasifying within two years, so Riverside will fast track itself up to a link and carbon stage, carbon energy stage, without any of the risk of expending its own capital in Indonesia, which does make me feel a little bit nervous. What we're doing, I think, here is terrific. And the coal is excellent. It's 15 metres at three to 400 metres deep. And these are all existing gas... In fact, there's a large power gas, gas pipeline through here that goes to supply Singapore. It's a, I've never seen so many gas pipelines crisscrossing the, the country in all my life. So, uh, the important message is that Riverside's currently undertaking a one mil capital raising and that money will be spent on bringing the Firth of Forth up to a Jork uh, standard and in obtaining more coal assets. And Riverside is the exciting company in UCG. UCG is going to provide an increasing amount of power in the world and it's probably where CBM or UC, uh, CSG was five or six years ago. People had just sort of started about to hear about it. And if you don't know where CVM went, a lot of people made a lot of money out of it. Thank you very much.